Hello, I'm Joshua Finn with JNH Aerospace. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about our propeller hubs. I've received some requests uh, for more information on how to adjust uh, variable pitch propeller hubs for indoor model airplanes, uh, both our hubs and uh, those produced uh, privately and, and through uh, Yvonne Schrager and so on. Um, so you can see me surrounded by uh, airplanes with uh, variable pitch propeller hubs. We're going to talk about what the uh, what the concept is, why you would want a variable pitch propeller hub, um, and, and how to operate them. Uh, this is an old F1D propeller hub uh, from oh about uh, four or five years ago um, uh, would would be where the when this one dates from. Um, this is uh, probably about uh, sixty percent heavier than what we're producing nowadays. Um, it provides you with the, the basic operating concept. The, the, the concept is that you have this low pitch setting that allows you to operate the propeller um, at, at, at a low torque setting uh, and, and be able to climb on that. Uh, but if you're in a, uh, a site other than a, a very, very low ceiling, this setup, as you pack more turns into your rubber motor to, to fly longer, is just going to punch you into the ceiling and you're going to be bouncing around up, up there and not really accomplish anything or potentially even get hung up. Uh, so you can turn that, uh, that higher torque section of the flight into uh, more time and also keep you out of uh, obstructions by having the propeller able to shift up to a, a higher pitch at the beginning of the flight. So that slows the propeller down. Um, does not do it by stalling it. There is a stalling angle of attack you can hit on these uh, on these propeller blades, uh, and at that point, basically, the propeller uh, really stops uh, producing significant thrust. So you always want to stay below whatever that angle is. There's there's some angle at which these these propellers just they, they stop working, uh, and each blade design and pitch distribution is different. Um, but that being said, uh, what this enables you to do is uh, is slow the propeller down. So it takes longer to unwind, and it, it uh, allows you to climb up very efficiently. And uh, typically what will happen, um, because the uh, torque curve on the spring is, is more or less linear, and the rubber motor has a um, much highly nonlinear torque curve, uh, what you'll do is you'll climb up uh, almost to the ceiling and allow the airplane to fall back slightly. So the, uh, the propeller drops, uh, the, the torque drops below uh, that which uh, the propeller can uh, produce enough power to climb at that setting. Uh, and then this little spring allows the, uh, the propeller to start uh, dropping its pitch. So at that point, you will, um, once you've dropped down to, uh, to this uh, lower torque, um, after you have, have leveled out, um, then you're, you gradually let the propeller come down in its pitch, um, and eventually the airplane starts climbing back up. Uh, and then you'll gain that remaining one-third of, um, of your available altitude. Uh, maybe tap the ceiling a few times and then proceed on down um, having that climb, uh, if it's in a low ceiling site, um, on, on an F1D have that end uh, around 14-15 uh, minutes into the, into the flight um, and then have the remainder being, a, being basically a uh, very low powered uh, descent. Um, if you're flying in, uh, in Slonic or a, a high ceiling site uh, like that, uh, typically you're not going to be running a uh, variable pitch propeller. You're going to be running a, uh, a fixed pitch and your goal is going to be to, in the first six minutes, um, use whatever that uh, cruise pitch setting is uh, to climb the airplane all the way up to the ceiling and then the remainder of the flight you're just going to try to hang on to altitude as long as possible. That's why really high sites like Salonic get to be uh, quite challenging to fly in. Um, Lakehurst is warmer, so you can um, start to go back to variable pitch there. Uh, Kibbe sites like, uh, like Kibbe and West, uh, West Baden, any of those, you're going um, gonna to need a variable pitch propeller. This will punch you into the ceiling. You just will not get those, those really long flights. So, um, we've mentioned that you have a double climb uh, procedure. 
So we're going to show you a, an operational video uh, with, with this aircraft um, and, uh, and you'll get to see what, what happens when you, uh, when you steer the airplane by the propeller during that transition phase. But it'll also give you an example of seeing what that double climb strategy uh, looks like in, in low ceiling flying. So what we're going to do here is, um, this is a mostly wound F1D, we're going to do a demonstration of the flight profile on this and I'm going to accelerate it a little bit by doing a, uh, a propeller steer um, so that the airplane doesn't, uh, so that the, the second climb is kind of uh, premature. And we'll see what the effect of that is and it'll kind of demonstrate how these propellers work and it'll also give you some, uh, some um, cautions as to things to not do. So, off we go, and we're all happy-like, slowly climbing away. I did not give this one full torque, so it's climbing relatively slowly. We see the RPM uh, starts off reasonably high um, in the 50s, and where I see it drop off into the uh, low 30s fairly, fairly quickly. As the airplane's already beginning to lose altitude. Uh, we're about 30 seconds in, so for a Cat 1 uh, flight, we look for about two minutes of climb. We're on a quarter motor, about 30 seconds. And now I'm going to do a uh, quick steer and watch what happens. Notice the RPM picks up very, very dramatically. The airplane climbs away a second time. And So the RPM has picked up very dramatically. Now we get our, our second climb uh, very, very prematurely because the, uh, the propeller, has, the hub has some friction in it. Um, this is not one of the hubs we sell. This is an older design line. It has some friction in it. Uh, so when you steer by the propeller at that transition point, uh, the, air, the propeller will stick into low pitch and it uh, will climb very, very prematurely, so then you jump right back up into the ceiling when you steer by the propeller like that. So it's great for demo purposes, but the problem that you see here is you're wasting energy already climbing up there. So if you have to steer by the propeller, you want to avoid doing it during this, uh, that transition phase uh, on, on a propeller hub, where you'll climb back up into the ceiling, and if you're like at the kidney dome or something like that, in addition to burning off all those turns, you run the risk of getting stuck up there in the rafters. And so we see, of course, the, uh, the rest of the flight is um, truncated somewhat. The airplane's already uh, prematurely on its way back down because it's used up all of that available energy. Um, so you, you abbreviate, abbreviate your flight uh, tremendously because you're uh, really, in this point, you, you know, you're running at twice the RPM you should have uh, should have been on that uh, that phase of the um, the torque curve. So let me uh, let this airplane circle back around to me here, and we'll uh, continue some of this. So, in um, Low ceiling flying, uh, this is the reason that you tr primarily see people steering uh, by this area of, of the aircraft. Um, is is not a, a uh, tactical method to, to try to gain some advantage. It's that if you steer from back there, you don't run the risk of shifting your propeller prematurely. Conversely, if you're in a high sight, you don't have uh, that option. You're going to be steering with a balloon, so you're not going to be able to steer uh, by, by the tail boom because uh, the balloon has too much lag in it. So what you want to do is if you see your plane drifting or if you know it's going to drift, you want to steer either before the propeller, is, uh, the torque has dropped low enough that that transition can occur by, by you snagging on the, uh, the balloon line, or you'll want to uh, wait until afterwards. Um, so you want to, there's a, a very important tactic there of, of spacing out your steers to make sure that you don't uh, accidentally uh, transition that propeller early 
and climb up into the ceiling. On the other hand, you've also seen, uh, because of this, you've gotten to see the very distinct double climb feature that we talked about with variable pitch propellers. Um, some of the, the newer uh, spring designs that are being used uh, the, and different uh, trim setups can give you a, a single climb, um, but, but the, the traditional pattern is, is that double climb where you climb up to the ceiling, fall back, and then climb up slightly higher the second time. The propeller that we see right here, uh, this is the, the old propeller I was demonstrating with. You can see it's, uh, it's all wood, uh, uses um, Dacron hinge material and an aluminum driver arm. This is the, the propeller hub that we're currently selling for F1Ds. This is uh, this little tiny thing right here. This is uh, our F1R hub. This is the um, version 1.1, which is the ultralight uh, torsion shaft hub, so you can see this, uh, this little loop that comes around. That's actually your, your spring mechanism in this hub. You can see how, it, um, how it's able to change pitch there. I have this one set up for high ceiling, so there's not a whole lot of pitch range. Um, this is the version, the, the original version um, of our carbon VP hubs. This one was never offered for sale. This is what I set my, my first record with. And, and we now are, um, are using these uh, basically as, as a demonstrator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this one to demonstrate the, the functionality of, of these uh, propeller hubs. And, and the way this hub works is this, uh, this screw right here on, your, on, on the outside um, that, that sets your high pitch. So if you're looking from the front, this, uh, this hub that's on top, or screw, sorry, the screw that's on top, this is your high pitch screw. This sets uh, whatever your high pitch angle is after you've got your uh, propeller set up. Um, this screw down here is your low pitch limiter. So when you assemble your, your propeller, what you're gonna do is you're, you're gonna drill holes into your uh, propeller spars and you're gonna mount them on these on these little probes. Um, typically, you'll use CA glue or something of that nature. And the the setting that we supply the hubs with for your low pitch um, set attach the blades with the propeller in that mode, and then you have a little bit more low pitch range if that proves to be too high of a pitch setting. Uh, but usually it, it, that, that'll give you just enough adjustment range if, if you get things kind of low. So set, the, set up the propeller about uh, 26 to 28 inches uh, geometric pitch, um, and, and then you'll still have an, a little bit of adjustment range. And then you can set this screw to whatever you want your high pitch limit to be, and you'll have to determine that experimentally. Um, the third screw is this one down here, and this one is your uh, preload, and it sets where the transition point is going to be from high pitch to low pitch. And again, that's a fairly gradual transition during the flight. We, we showed uh, a very abrupt transition earlier, but if left alone, uh, that takes place over a period usually of about um, six to ten minutes. So these screws are uh, double aught dash uh, 90 pitch, um, 90 threads per inch um, nylon screws. And we have cut the, the tops of the screws off so that they have a blade head. And this tool allows you to turn that head. So you can adjust each of those screws using that method. Now the last thing I'm gonna show you about this propeller. Take this uh, propeller apart and, and we're going to, so what we're gonna do is uh, this, this little retainer section has been glued on with CA and I can crack that loose I already had it loose, so we'll set that aside. And now, what we can do is we can slide the uh, whole assembly backwards, our shaft assembly. We can set it down, and we notice that it has a little bitty spring attached to it. So, the spring is on top. I have a, uh, a Teflon washer underneath. I have my carbon driver arm, and I always want to be mindful of the, the orientation of this. Because if we notice, if we turn this, uh, this guy, 
the, uh, the output shaft is slightly out of line with our input shaft. And it's very important because the, uh, the propeller hub itself is offset. So the axle is on one side of our, of our propeller hub. Now, the most difficult component of, of these hubs to manufacture is actually this rocker arm because it has to have the little rocker pegs and also provide our, our pitch input and whatnot and, and be very rigid. And when you purchase one of our newer hubs, you'll notice it looks much different from this. Um, and that's because we've, we've gone to a stronger design that does not have those problems. Uh, on the other side, we just have a uh, top hat bent um, piece of wire that uh, rides within this carbon tube. So we can slide everything back together. And I'm not going to try to fully reassemble this hub on video. Um, and so we have our, our rocking arrangement we see right here. And this allows us to set our, our high and low pitch limits, as we mentioned before. And the little spring that we have here engages into the, um, this uh, preload screw and it dri is driving against this carbon driver arm. And that provides our entire uh, mechanism for this propeller. And again, we'll uh, compare that to, uh, to this propeller. Our pitch limiting occurs over here between these little wire stops. And I know, let's slide this guy out of the way. Um, I know that's kind of hard to see, but there's, there's one on each side and they set the, the high and low pitch limits on this propeller. The one on the high side has a little bit of flex to it, and you know, that's actually to your benefit because that allows you to basically have a secondary spring on your higher pitch setting, and that's useful in F1R because you have a lot of power you're trying to tame. Um, so basically your adjustments are bending little wires either side. Uh, don't want to bend them too often because eventually they will fatigue and break. And then our um, final adjustment is our, our little um, preload screw that's positioned right here. And depending on which of the, these hubs you order, the, uh, the uh, 1.0 and 1.1 uh, F1R hubs both have this arrangement. Um, the 2.0 hubs uh, have, a, have a cutout in here because you have a torsion spring uh, instead of a torsion shaft. And that allows you to have a, a softer spring so it's more useful in, in low ceiling sites. Um, and that's how you get those super long flights is to have a nice soft spring. So that's pretty much all that um, there is to the mechanisms of these. Uh, there are some tutorials online for, uh, for building some of the older hubs, the, uh, the Banks hubs and the, uh, the Steve Brown designs. Um, and those are, uh, those are pretty much the standard. Uh, actually, I should say uh, Brown's and Hunt's designs are fairly similar. It's the, um, sorry, Brown and Banks. Hunt's design... Uh, is what kind of gave birth to uh, to, to these uh, newer hubs in, in many ways.